Number one in your gospel hymns book, number one. We have come into this place to call upon his name and worship him. We have come into this place to call upon his name and worship him. We have come into this place to call upon his name and worship Christ the Lord. Worship him, Jesus Christ the Lord. So forget about yourself and magnify his name and worship him. So forget about yourself and magnify his name and worship him. So forget about yourself and magnify his name and worship Christ the Lord. Worship him, Jesus Christ the Lord. We are debtors to his grace. The law's been satisfied, now worship him. We are debtors to his grace. The law's been satisfied, now worship him. We are debtors to his grace. The law's been satisfied, now worship Christ the Lord. Worship him. Jesus Christ the Lord. We are chosen in his grace, redeemed by his blood, now worship him. We are chosen in his grace, redeemed by his blood, now worship him. We are chosen in his grace, redeemed by his blood, now worship Christ the Lord. Worship him, Jesus Christ the Lord. He is all our righteousness, I stand in him complete, now worship him. He is all our righteousness, I stand in him complete, now worship him. He is all our righteousness, I stand in him complete, now worship Christ the Lord. Worship him, Jesus Christ the Lord. My God, the Holy Spirit, give us the grace to worship. He'll have to do it if we do. Well, let's stand together. Brother Tom, you're going to lead us in number... 32 in the same hymn book, number 32. Let's stand together. All children of wrath in bondage and sin, we helplessly lay. God's law in its infinite justice and wrath demanded we suffer an eternal death. But long 
long before time had ever begun, one stood in our place, God's glorious Son. He offered himself to go live among men and give his own life to atone for our sin. The great substitute, behold, he has come. The price has been paid, the work is all done. Christ took on himself the great load of our sin. He poured out his blood and he put away sin. God's justice and law are now satisfied and all who believe have been justified through faith in the blood of the Lamb we are free from sin's condemnation eternally free please be seated For our call to worship, would you please turn with me in the Word of God to Mark chapter 4. Mark chapter 4. And as we read the Word of God, we always ask ourselves... What does this tell us about Christ and how he saves his people? If we don't see that, we might as well read Grimm's fairy tales because there's no difference. Let us begin in verse 2, please. And the Lord is speaking. And he taught them many things by parables. And he said unto them in his doctrine, Hearken. Listen, I'm going to tell you something important. Behold, there went out a sower to sow. And it came to pass, as he sowed, some fell by the wayside, and the fowls of the air came and devoured it up. And some fell on stony ground, where it had not much earth, and immediately it sprang up, because it had no depth of earth. Then when the sun was up, it was scorched, and because it had no root, it withered away. And some fell among thorns, and thorns grew up and choked it, and it yielded no fruit. And another fell on good ground, and did yield fruit that sprang up and increased, and brought forth some thirty, and some sixty, and some a hundred. And this is our call to worship. And the Lord said unto them, He that hath ears to hear, Let him hear. That's why we're here this morning. And when he was alone, now notice this is his disciples. They that were with him, with the twelve, asked of him the parable. And this is what our Lord told them. And he said unto them, Unto you it is given to know the mystery of the kingdom of God. But unto them that are without, all these things are done in parables. That seeing, this is the unbeliever, that seeing they may see and not perceive. And hearing they may hear and not understand. Lest at any time they should be converted and their sins should be forgiven. This next hour, our shepherd is going to speak words to the people in this auditorium and anyone that's in the internet. And they're going to be able to physically hear everything he says. But unless the Lord gives the grace, they'll not understand. And if you can understand the declaration of Christ this morning, 
It's because the Lord made your soil fertile. Because it wasn't any different than the soil of anyone else. And that's our plea this morning. He that has ear to hear, let him hear. And if you don't understand this morning, my dear friend, our prayer is that you'll plead with God to give you the ability to understand. May we try to pray. Lord, we've gathered this morning desperate, needy sinners that we confess we can do nothing for ourselves. We can't even pray unless you enable us to, and we certainly cannot understand unless you send your Spirit and you reveal yourself to us and you teach us, Lord. We thank you for the opportunity to be taught. As we come, we pray for your servants, our pastor, and wherever your preachers are at, and their families, Lord, that you would bless them, encourage them, that you would speak to us through them. And, Lord, we confess we can do nothing, and we plead for you, Lord. Oh, enable us to hear with understanding. And, Lord, would you give us the faith to believe. And, Lord, we plead with those today who can hear but do not understand that their case is a desperate one. <clears throat> oh, that they may see themselves as lost sinners and that you would gather them to yourself. We, alone, we know you alone are able to save them. We plead for their souls as well as ours. We ask this, that Christ would take this prayer. And that he would make it acceptable to God the Father. And that he alone would be glorified. Amen. Let's stand together once again. And we'll sing hymn number 352 from the hardback hymnal. 352. <clears throat> Jesus, lover of my soul, let me to thy bosom fly. While the nearer waters roll, while the tempest still is high, hide me, O oh my Savior, hide, till the storm soul on thee. Leave, ah, leave me not alone. Still support and comfort me. All my trust on thee is stayed. All my help from thee I bring. Cover defenseless head with the shadow of thy wing. Thou, O Christ, art all I want, more than all in thee I find. Raise the fallen, cheer the faint, heal the sick and lead the just and holy is thy name. I am all unrighteousness. False and full of sin I am. Thou art full of truth and grace. Plenteous grace with thee is found. 
grace to cover all my sin. Let the healing streams abound, make and keep me pure within. Thou of life the fountain art, freely let me take of thee. Spring thou up within my heart, rise to all eternity. Please be seated. Michael, I don't know if you could have read a more appropriate passage fit with the message the Lord's put on my heart for this morning. I've titled this message, When God is Silent. What happens when God is silent? Turn with me, if you will, please, in your Bibles to Psalm 28. And then you might want to also find Isaiah chapter 44. Psalm 28 and Isaiah 44. When God is silent... Psalm 28, verse 1. Unto thee will I cry, O Lord, my rock. What do we cry? Most of the times we cry out to God, we're wanting some relief from our temporal circumstances. Isn't that true? But when one cries in faith... He's crying that God would speak. Lord, I need you to speak to my soul. Unto thee will I cry, O Lord, my rock, be not silent to me. Lest if thou be silent to me, I become like them that go to hell. What does God have to do for me and you to go to hell? Nothing. Nothing. All he has to do is be silent. All he has to do is leave us to ourselves. Our own opinions, our own devices, the, the voices and values of this world will be all we'll have if God doesn't speak. And so, the one whom the Lord has stirred up his soul for salvation, the one who has a burden to know God and to be saved, cries unto the Lord his rock, be not silent to me. For Lord, if you be silent to me, if you don't speak to me, if you don't reveal yourself to me, I'll be like everyone else that goes down into the pit. The only hope that I have of being delivered from the pit is that God would speak to me. You see, the truth is, according to the word of God, we're born into this world spiritually dead. We're born spiritually dead. God says, we come from the womb speaking lies. (laughs) When that little baby cries as if he's going to die because he's hungry or has a dirty diaper, he's lying. He's lying. <laughs> and what endears us to, a, to an infant is that they're not able to hide their lies. But that's what we are. We just, uh, the world is here to serve me. <laughs> Come tend to my needs. <laughs> 
We come from the womb speaking lies. And we, we're, just, we're just so consumed with ourselves, aren't we? From the very beginning, we're consumed with ourselves. And God says, except you be born of water and of the Spirit, there's no life in you. Now, the water is the Word. Washed by the water of God's word, of his own will, begat he us or birthed us with the word of truth. And this is the word which by the gospel is preached unto you. So when the gospel's preached, that's the means by which God births us into his family. And then, of course, the word of God has to be attended by the spirit of God. You remember in Ezekiel chapter 37 when God took Ezekiel up on a mountain and he looked down into a valley. And the scripture says that the valley was filled with dry bones. They were very dry. And uh, the Lord tells Ezekiel that this is the whole house of Israel. These are my people. They raised their fist in rebellion against me and they died. And now they're left lying on the battlefield as dried bones. The birds, have, the birds of prey have plecked away all the flesh. There's not enough DNA left in those bones for, uh, for, for you to, to figure out who they are. And God says to the, to, the, to the prophet, son of man, can these bones live? <laughs> and what's Ezekiel say? Lord, thou knowest. If they're going to live, you're going to have to make them live. You're going to have to do a miracle of grace for them. And that's the way it is for every one of us. And so God says, all right, preach to them. Prophesy to them. Lord, they're dry bones. Yep. (laughs) And as a prophet began to preach the gospel, bone came to bone and sinew came to bone, and the, and the bones became in the body of a man, and they, and, and, and they took shape. That's what happens when the gospel is preached. God begins to put things together. Yet there was no life in them. There was no life in them. And so God says to the prophet, prophesy to the wind. Call upon the Spirit of God to come. And breathe life into these dead men. And he did. He called out for the Spirit of God to come. It's why in Acts chapter 6, when the church was, was struggling with some of the problems of distributing the food and different things, Peter stood up and he said, uh, he said, choose out from among you men that are capable of this. God has called us to prayer and the preparation of the word. This is the means by which sinners are saved. The preaching of the gospel attended by the Spirit of God. And apart from that, everything else is in vain. So we come into this world dead if God doesn't speak. And speak not just audibly. But speak spiritually. And when I say God speaking audibly, God speaks when his word is read. <laughs> so if you're hearing, as Michael said, you're hearing my words, and my words are, are God's word, this is what God says, you're hearing audibly. Oh, but how dependent we are for the Spirit of God to make those words effectual to our hearts. Lord, be not silent to me, for if thou be silent, I'll go down into the pit. Lord, I need for you to speak to me. What happens when God is silent? Man is incurably religious. He knows in his conscience that there is a God with whom he must do. And so if God's silent, 
If the God who is doesn't speak to him, he will devise his own God. And that's all man-made religion is. It's man's idolatrous attempt to communicate with a God who hasn't spoken to him. It happened to the children of Israel at Mount Sinai, didn't it? When Moses went up on the mountain to get the law, the children of Israel said, uh, this Moses who brought us out of Egypt, they're talking to Aaron now. Uh, we don't know where he's gone. Uh, God's not speaking. Uh, we need to make a God. And so Aaron instructed the people. He said, well, take off your earrings. And, and, and Aaron, the scripture says Aaron put them into the fire and fashioned a golden calf. Aaron made that calf. And the people began to worship the golden calf. And Moses came down off the mountain with the law on the tablets. And what did Moses do with those tablets that were written by the very finger of God? He broke them, didn't he? This is, this is man's incurable sin, to create for himself a God. And Moses asked Aaron, Aaron, what have you done? And Aaron said, well, the people became impatient, and you didn't come, and God wasn't speaking, and so I threw the gold into the fire, and out popped a calf. That's what he said, out popped a calf. Not only was the law of God broken by their idolatry, Moses took that golden calf, the scripture says, and he ground it into powder, mixed it with water, and made the people drink it. Same thing happened to the serpent that was put upon a pole, isn't it? Well, what happens to that which you ingest into your body? It becomes dung, doesn't it? And Paul said, that which I thought was gain, I now call a loss, and I count all things but dung for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ. All of my idolatry, all of my idolatry. It, it, when God speaks, when God reveals the glory of Christ to the heart, then you confess, Lord, I've been an idolater ever since I was born. I've been fashioning images of you that were, that were not true to your image. And now that you've spoken, now that you've spoken, I realize that I made a God of my own hands, just like the children of Israel did, a God that I could see and a God that I could control. You have your Bibles. Turn with me, if you will, to Isaiah chapter 44. Idolaters are shameless. They're actually proud of their idols. And the work that they did to produce them. I was talking to a man some time ago. He was a professor in college. And he was in his 70s, had a Ph.D. in philosophy. And he admitted to me, he said, I'm still struggling with the same questions that I struggled with when I was a student in college. Did we create God or did he create us? That was his question. Well, the God that most people worship is created by man. There is a God. <laughs> there is a God who made us. But if he doesn't speak and if he doesn't reveal himself to us, we'll just make for ourselves a God. And that's what Isaiah chapter 44 is all about. You have your Bibles? Look with me at verse 9. They that make a graven image are all of them vanity. And their delectable things they shall not profit. They are their own witnesses. They see not nor know that they may be ashamed. They're not ashamed of their God. They're proud of it. They're proud of the decision that they made. <laughs> They're proud of the, of the idols that they fashioned. They're proud of the works that they performed. Who hath formed a god or molten a graven image that is profitable for nothing? 
Behold, all his fellows shall be ashamed, and the workmen they are of men. Let them all be gathered together, let them stand up. Yet they shall fear, and they shall be ashamed together. And when God breaks you about your idolatry, you're ashamed. You're ashamed of the idols that you made. But in order for that to happen, he has to speak. He has to reveal himself. The smith with the tongs both worketh in the coals and fashioneth it with hammers and worketh it with the strength of his arms. Yea, he is hungry and his strength faileth and he drinketh no water and is faint and the carpenter stretcheth out his rule. He maketh it out with a line. He fitteth it with planes and he maketh it out with a compass and maketh it after the figure of a man according to the beauty of a man that it may remain in the house. He heweth him down cedars and taketh the cypress and the oak, which he stretcheth for himself, what he strengtheneth for himself among the trees of the forest. He planteth an ash, and the rain doth nourish it. Then shall it be for a man to burn, for he will take thereof and warm himself. Yea, he kindleth it and breaketh and baketh bread. He maketh a god and worshipeth it. He maketh it a graven image and falleth down thereto. He burneth part thereof in the fire, and with part thereof he eateth flesh. He roasteth roast, he satisfieth, yea, he warmeth himself, and saith, Aha, I am warm, I have seen the fire, and the residue thereof he maketh a god. Even his graven image he falleth down into it, and worshipeth it, and prayeth unto it, and saith, Deliver me, for thou art my God. They have not known nor understood For he hath shut their eyes that they cannot see and their hearts that they cannot understand. If God is silent to you and me, we will be shameless idolaters. We will fashion a God after ourselves. Psalm 50 verse 21 says, Thou thoughtest that I was altogether as unto thyself. So what man does in his imagination, I don't think that idolatry is something that, uh, that, that some uh, uh, primitive tribe does in New Guinea. Uh, idolatry is what, we're all, is what we're all addicted to until the Lord speaks. Until the Lord's pleased to reveal himself. We're going to fashion an idol. And we're going to be shameless about our idol. We're going to be proud of our idol. We'll be proud of the decisions that we made. We'll be proud of the aisle that we walked. Or the church that we supported. Or the sacrifices that we made. Or the knowledge that we have achieved. Man by nature is going to have a God that he makes that he makes. Now, what's the difference between a God that we make and a God who is? Well, look at, um, let's, let's go back to our text. Verse 19, and none considereth in his heart, neither is there knowledge nor understanding to say, I have burned part of it in the fire. Yea, also I have baked bread upon the coals thereof. I have roasted flesh and eaten it and shall make the residue thereof an abomination. Shall I fall down to the stalk of a tree? He feedeth on ashes and a deceived heart hath turned him aside and he cannot deliver his soul nor say, Is there not a lie in my right hand? He doesn't know that the God that he's worshiping is a false God. He doesn't know it's an idol. He doesn't know that it's a figment of his imagination. Why? Because the God who is has not yet spoken. And when he speaks, when he speaks, then the God who is reveals all the idolatries all the idols that man devised in his own imagination. Look at verse 21. Remember these, O Jacob and Israel, for thou art my servant. 
I have formed thee, thou art my servant, O Israel, thou shalt not be forgotten of me. I have blotted out as a thick cloud thy transgressions, and as a cloud thy sins. Return unto me, for I have redeemed thee. (laughs) You see, one is a religion that depends upon man to do something to persuade God. And then God says, I formed you. You didn't form me. You're dependent upon me. I'm not dependent upon you. A religion that's based on man making for himself a God. You see, in in man-made religion, the scriptures are subordinate to experience. A God who makes us, a God who speaks, speaks through his word... And in man-made religion, the Word of God is subordinate to one's own personal experience, one's own personal opinion. The Word of God becomes subordinate to tradition. The Word of God becomes subordinate to creeds. It becomes subordinate to the opinions of men. And so... Man fashions a God after what he believes. He won't say what saith the scriptures. And if he does go to the Bible in order to find God, he goes with, well, he goes with presuppositions that are just wrong. They're just wrong. You know, a We've all done it. You buttoning up your shirt, you get to the end, and you realize you got a button left over. <laughs> How are you going to fix that problem? You got to unbutton the whole shirt, don't you? You got to start back with the first button. But men won't do that. They'll go to the Word of God with with faulty presuppositions and try to reconcile what they thought was true to what they're reading. Men will go to the Word of God with the idea that. God loves everybody. And then they'll try to figure out, well, how does, the, how does the God who has revealed himself here reconcile with this idea that God loves everybody, Christ died for everybody, God wants everybody to be saved? And they can't make sense of it. You can make sense of it. They'll go to the Bible with the presupposition that man has a free will. It's up to me to make a decision, to pray the prayer, to accept Jesus into my heart. You see, man by nature is going to create for himself his own God because he denies the truth of the Bible and relies on those things which he believes to be true. A God that he can make. And what does God say? Remember Jacob. Remember Israel. I made you. I redeemed you. I put away your sins. (laughs) I did this. It's not of him that willeth. It is not of man's free will. It is not of him that runneth. It is not of man's efforts or good works. It's of God that showeth mercy. God made us. We didn't make him. But man by nature wants a God that he can see. He has no faith. And so the only sight that he has is that which is physical. That's why man-made religion is so filled with things to entice the eyes. Stained glass windows. Icons. (laughs) Statues. Robes. Choirs, all the things that are, that, that are attracted to the flesh. Why? Because he needs a God that he can see. That's why 
men want a gospel that promotes the works of man rather than the accomplished work of Christ. You see, you can't see with your physical eyes the work that the Lord Jesus Christ accomplished 2,000 years ago. You can't see it. (laughs) If the Spirit of God doesn't take the Word of God and speak effectually to your heart and cause you to believe that the Lord Jesus Christ is the end of the law for righteousness, that he has put away once and for all all the sins of all of God's people, satisfying divine justice, declaring it's finished. If you can't see that, if you don't have eyes of faith to see that, that happened completely outside of you. That happened 2,000 years ago. And if you can't look to that for the hope of your salvation, you're going to look to your works for the hope of your salvation. And you're going to measure and monitor and motivate yourself by the law to try to gain assurance of salvation. Why? Because you need a God that you can see. Jacob... Israel, thou art my servant. I made you. (laughs) I redeemed you. And finally, man needs a God that he can control. A God that he can control. Turn with me to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Verse 10. And with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, them that go down to the pit. He's talking about false false religion. He's talking about man-made, free will, works religion. To people to whom God has not spoken. In them that perish, because they receive not the love of the truth, that they might be saved. And for this cause, God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe the lie. It is the definite article there, the lie. The lie is that man has saved himself. The lie is that man has made God. That they all might be damned who believe not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. Now, that doesn't mean that they went out and indulged their flesh in the, in the sinful pleasures of this world. It means that they pleasured themselves in believing that they were right with God based on something they did, which was all unrighteousness. And that's what religion's all about. Man competing with man to see who's more righteous. Pleasuring themselves in unrighteousness. God turns man over to a strong delusion. They believe it with all their heart. And you'd believe it too. You were born an idolater. And if God doesn't speak, oh Lord my rock, be not silent to me. For if thou be silent to me... I will be like everybody else. I'll go down into the pit. Who maketh thee to differ? What do you have that you've not received? Oh, Lord, speak to me. Reveal Christ to me. Verse 13, But we are bound to give thanks always to God for you, brethren, beloved of the Lord. Lord, show me. That you've loved your people with an everlasting love. Never been a time when God didn't love his elect. Chosen in the covenant of grace. Placed in Christ before the foundation of the world. Always loved of God. That's the gospel. Because God hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation through 
sanctification of the Spirit. It's the Spirit of God that makes us holy. He that sanctifieth and they that are sanctified are all as one. You can't get more sanctified. Not if you're in Christ. If you're in Christ, you're perfect before God. Man, the beginning of that chapter, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, speaks of man setting himself up on the throne of God and calling himself God. Now that's what man-made religion is all about. Here's the message of man-made religion. God votes for you. The devil votes against you. You break the tie. That's the message of man-made religion. You're the deciding factor. You're the one that holds the power. You're the one that makes the decision. You've set yourself up on the throne of God if you believe that. And you fashion for yourself a God that you can see and a God that you can control. Go back with me to our text in Isaiah 44, please. He doesn't even know in verse 20 that there is a lie in his hand. Why? Because God has turned him over to a strong delusion and he believes the lie is true. He believes the lie is true. He believes with all of his heart. He's not questioning what he believes. Why is he not questioning what he believes? Because God's not speaking to him. When God speaks, you call everything into question. Everything that you ever believed about yourself, about God, about salvation, you know when God speaks, you've been wrong all your life. But he's got a lie in his hand. He doesn't know it's a lie. And so God says, remember these, O Jacob, Jacob Israel, that's our name. Jacob's the old man, Israel's the new man. For thou art my servant, I have formed thee, thou art my servant, O Israel, thou shalt not be forgotten of me. The hope of your salvation is not determined by your faithfulness, but by mine. I'm going to keep you from falling. I'm going to present you faultless. I have blotted out as a thick cloud thy transgressions. You didn't do anything, you didn't do anything to, to persuade me. I did it. I did it before you were born. <laughs> I did it before Adam was made. Christ is called the lamb slave before the foundation of the world. God in a covenant of grace that he established according to his own will and purpose, before time ever began, took care of the fall. Before the fall ever happened, he took care of it. (laughs) You see, the fall was ordained for Christ. Christ didn't come into the picture to fix the fall. The fall was ordained of God to glorify Christ. (laughs) I've already taken care of all this. I've already blotted out your sins. I've already satisfied my justice. You came from the womb speaking lies and you've been an idolater all your life. but, But now that I've spoken, now that I've spoken, you understand that I formed you. You didn't form me. And as a cloud, thy sins, I've put them away. Return unto me, for I have redeemed thee. He doesn't say return unto me and I will redeem thee. He says return unto me, for I have redeemed thee. 
Now, how oftentimes do you need to return to the Lord? I mean, we just, we're perpetual backsliders, aren't we? And what is it that causes us to return? The hope that returning will, will somehow cause him to reward us? No. No, what causes us to return is to know that we've already been redeemed. It's already been taken care of. Everything's done. Sing, O ye heavens, for the Lord hath done it. Now I want to close with the, you know, you've heard me say this before. I just want to say it again. It's so simple. Man-made idolatrous religion is all about what you do. A prayer you pray, a work you perform, a law you try to keep, a level of, uh, 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 of, uh, of preeminence that you achieve over your, over your fellow man, a knowledge that you acquire, and it doesn't matter if you're talking about Buddhism or Islam or, or, or what's called Christianity. It's all the same. It's all the same. It's all about what you do. Now let's read this phrase again. Sing, O ye heavens, for the Lord hath done it. <laughs> it's done There's a big difference between doing and done, isn't it? It's just done. When the Lord Jesus Christ bowed his head on Calvary's cross, he cried with a loud voice, It is finished. It's finished. It's done. What a contrast. It's the God who is... And by his mercy speaks through his word. And the God devised in the imagination of man. Shout ye lower parts of the earth. (laughs) That's where the Lord got you from. If he spoke to you, you were at the bottom of the barrel when he spoke to you. That's where he gets his children from. He gets them out of the dust of the earth. He gets them out of the dung hill. He makes them to be sinners. And then he redeems them, delivers them. Ye lower parts of the earth, break forth into singing, ye mountains, O forest, and every tree therein. For the Lord hath redeemed Jacob and glorified himself in Israel. The trees of righteousness, the scripture calls his people, the plantings of the Lord. He did it to glorify himself. Man-made religion glorifies man. The gospel gives all the glory to Christ. All of it. Now, I want to conclude by asking you to turn with me to Isaiah 53. Isaiah 53. There is a time when you want God to be silent. Lord, be not silent to me. There is a time when you want God to be silent. Isaiah chapter 53. Verse 4, surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes we are, are healed. 
All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. The, this is a this is a prophecy given of the Lord Jesus Christ over six hundred years before he died on Calvary's cross, as our sin bearer. God imputing to the Lord Jesus Christ all the sins of all of God's people and pouring out his wrath in order to satisfy his justice. This is the passage that that Ethiopian eunuch was reading. Does the prophet speak of himself or of another? No, he's not talking about himself. Philip told him he's speaking of Jesus. And he he began right there and preached unto him Jesus, didn't he? Look at verse 7. He was oppressed and he was afflicted. Yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter and as a sheep before his shear, her shearers is dumb. So he opened not his mouth. There is a time when you want God to be silent. And that's when God Almighty was satisfying the justice of God by bearing our sins and suffering the wrath of his Father. Why was he silent? Why was he silent? The scripture says that when the law comes, every mouth is stopped. And all men become guilty before God. The law of God, the holy law of God, saw the sin that was placed on the Lord Jesus Christ. And his mouth was stopped. And he was guilty before God. Not for his own sin, but for our sins. God made him sin who knew no sin that we might become the righteousness of God in him. He had no defense. It pleased the father to bruise him. God saw sin on his son and God forsook him. God's eyes were too pure to look upon sin. He can't look upon you. He can't look upon me. He could not look upon the Lord Jesus Christ. That's why the skies were blackened. That's why the earth shook. That's why the Lord Jesus Christ cried out in agony. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Because he was forsaken. And his mouth was stopped by the law of God. And he was guilty before God. Suffering the wrath of God's justice. For the sins of his people. He did it out of love for his bride. That's the only time. That you want God to be silent. Annas. Caiaphas. Pilate. They all brought the Lord Jesus Christ before them. And tried to interrogate him. And he was silent to them. He was silent to them. He didn't speak to them. Oh, Lord, my rock, be not silent to me. For if thou be silent to me, I will be like everybody else. I'll go down into the pit. Our Heavenly Father, we're thankful that you have spoken and we pray that your Holy Spirit would make your words effectual to our hearts and thank you Lord Jesus for being silent on Calvary's cross satisfying the justice of God we ask it in Christ's name Amen let's stand together brother Tom 218? 318. Number 318.
tender voice like thine can peace afford. I need thee, oh, I need thee. Every hour I need thee. Oh, bless me now, my Savior. I come to thee. I need thee every hour. Stay thou nearby. Temptations lose their power when thou art nigh. I need thee, oh, I need thee. Every hour I need thee. Oh, bless me now, my Savior. I come. I need thee every hour in joy or pain. Come quickly and abide or life is vain. I need thee, oh, I need thee every hour I need thee. Oh, bless me now, my Savior, I come to Thee. I need Thee every hour, most holy one. Oh, make me Thine indeed, Thou blessed Son.